Okay, moving right along then. Um, I cheated a little bit. I looked at the spec which said computing for cyber, phys cyber physical systems in 2025. So there's computing, there's cyber physical systems, and there's 2025 in all of this. So I'm going to look at all of them in some uh, overview kind of way. Now, first of all, the pathway from science to exploitation. There is this kind of belief that you go from science to technology to product. And there's actually a big gap of reality which comes in there because there is a thing in the middle which I've realized is quite important and that's capability. Because businesses are interested in exploiting know-how, not in exploiting possibilities. They need to know what needs to be done. They need to be able to predict the future well enough to be able to put their money and their commitment in to get the, uh, to get the product to the market, to get it there. They have to know stuff here, not guess stuff. It takes work to do it, so it's a known work, however. That's the whole thing about business. The science and technology don't fit in that path as such. They're over here. Science becomes technology, technology becomes a capability, but they don't do it in isolation, almost never. Science is pretty go to a technology, technologies become a, capa a capability. There are a lot of capabilities required in a business before it can produce a product. And we have to remember that. So it's not just an automatic path. I've got words, no, oh, that's they don't come up yet. So the research is about inquiring, understanding, establishing, and um, understanding. And the exploitation is about exploitation, it's about using what we know. So I've got words which describe that, but the, the principal thing is that it can take many years to go from science before it's included in an end product. In, in, in some occasions, many tens of years. It takes a long time. It takes two or three years for a new capability to become part of a commercial product. These are long-term items. It essentially means that by 2025, we can only expect the computing technologies which are essentially on the table today. Science, which is still vague and cloud-like, is not going to make it in a 2025 timescale. Now others will ask, where do the technology uh, readiness levels fit in? Well actually they're over here, roughly in this order. Product de delivery needs technology levels, the readiness levels around the 8 or 9, but capabilities need to have it as well, because it's only when it is a demonstrable capability that businesses will take it in to their critical design flow. So the technology readiness levels, you get to 8 and 9 remarkably quickly, but before it becomes a product, you've got a long way to go down a road. All right. Second person to discover the uh, non equal sign today. <laughs> computing is not computing. Um, the problem is we use the term computing and we imply all kinds of things that go along with it. There is general purpose computing, which is the middle one, which is the programmable one, but you've also got fixed computing, which is algorithmic solution. And in the algorithmic solution, we've got an awful lot of stuff there which is essentially fixed processing. Um, it includes analog electronics. You think about a, a, an old-fashioned analog radio is doing signal processing. It's continuous time signal processing. It's computation. But we don't tend to think of computers as being that kind of computers. The general purpose ones, GPUs, CPUs, DSPs, FPGAs, and I put them in general purpose computing domain, um, are all very exciting, but they're only part of the computation space. The real thing about making a commercially successful cyber-physical system, be it today or in 2025, is the architecture of the computation that you use. So it's that collection of computation that you do which makes a successful thing. This, these babies, people talk about them as being digital. This is the digital world. It's actually got analog stuff in it. You know, it's, it's analog signal processing in there, fixed processing, it's computation. So the getting a system right, making this thing into a product, involves more than digital technology. It involves the integration of systems. And I think that that's an important thing. Cyber-physical system design is a system-level architectural challenge. 
we've got to think about systems ever more. And by 2025, that's going to be the challenge. Market interest is dominated by functional criteria. You don't actually get paid any more if that phone works. It's just expected to work. You get paid more if that phone is sexy. It's a strange thing to say, isn't it? Because we're technologists, we don't like that kind of abstract. But the people that buy it on the street buy it because it's sexy, not because it works. They expect it to work. <clears throat> so cost, power, time to market, density, productivity, reliability, style are all of the non-functional issues that have to be considered when you're architecting that problem. Whether it's on 14 nanometers, 10 nanometers, 5 nanometers wouldn't make this thing any smaller. Think about that. There won't be a single most important style of computing then. And it's no different from today. The capabilities that you haven't got as a business, that your competitors have, are the ones that limit your business success. It's a very negative way of looking at things, but if somebody can do something that I can't do, then that's a limitation to my business. So I need to be there I need to have my finger on the pulse. Now, it's the business opportunities that are driving technology. Look at this bottom line for a moment, if you will, because this is the mainframe computers. Back in 1970-ish, that was the, really the only domain which was electronics, microelectronics, electronics. It dominated the scene. There was none of this mini computers, personal computers. There was nothing there. This was very much a professional market. And I've got to say it, we still kind of feel that that's where we are. Its market hasn't gone away. It's still here today. It's probably an order of magnitude-ish bigger than it used to be, but it's not hundreds of orders of magnitude less. This is technology for science. In the meantime, we've been busy pushing technology out to the consumer. It means that it's not the science application anymore that is dominating technology development, it's the personal application. It's technology for pleasure, which is driving where we're going. IoT, mobile internet are not about technology, they're about satisfying a human itch. It's the, the professional markets still exist, but they're not driving the technology forward anymore. The technology drive is from up there, and it will continue to be so, because that's where the business opportunities lie. And the business opportunities, whether we like it or not, are the ones that are big enough to fund the technology developments, be it hardware, software, systems, interfaces, APIs, anything you like. They're all funded out of that. So 2025 will need volume markets, uh, sorry, and it will need physical technologies. But you, it doesn't take an, uh, an absolute genius to work out that RF analog digital mixed signal, mixed geometries, memory, non-volatile memory, 3D design, dyn stacking, automated assembly. And I've started to look here in terms of assembly as part of a product. You think about that. You can't make things like this by hand. You've got to use automated assembly. The uh, cameras, which have got the little micro motors in them, which do the auto-focusing and things like that, cannot be made by hand. So the assembly has become part of the product. <coughs> There's a lot of other things related to that. Um, high volume, low cost. Uh, Self-powered energy efficiency is becoming part of the system because you know there are becoming so many of these things that you can't actually ever go around and change all the batteries on them. Setting aside any other practical reasons of them, um, the previous graph did show a line which I like up there. The, that's the world population. The red line is more than 10 computers per person. You're not buying these things one at a time. You're buying them in a bucket load. You're buying them because of something else that they deliver to you, not because that they are a computer. So, computing architectures in various forms complement all of these, but there is also these virtual technologies. I hinted at them in the manufacturing space. System level productivity, uh, platforms, reuse methods, standards, they're all there, they're all needed, they're all part of the component of, of the things that are made, and if you don't have them, then you're incurring extra costs. Modeling, inseparable from these products, the model 
of what is intended in the design. The optimization of the architecture is part of the modeling process. The optimization of the non-functional constraints is part of the optimization process. But what runs on these things is a model. It's a model at the end of the day. It's an execution of a, of a model of reality as far as it's concerned. It has to work out where you are. It has to work out what you're doing from the sensors that you provide on the interface. It has to respond to you through the, the graphics that it's provided with. It's a software model. Occasionally it gets out of sync with reality and you don't know what it's doing and it doesn't know what you're doing. You press the reset button and they synchronize again. But that model is part of the production item. Um, so it goes. Manufacturing test is inseparable. You've not only got to make these things, they've got to be producible, but they have to be testable. They have to function. System level robustness and reliability is a system level issue. The components can't all be reliable. The commercial components, they just don't justify investment in reliable processes. So you've got to handle it somewhere else. So computing and the computing architectures underlie all of these again. So what then of new sciences? Quantum computing, spintronics, graphene, plastic electronics are all there along with fusion power. They're sciences. They aren't technologies yet and they're certainly not capabilities. They've all been demonstrated in concept, uh, but moving them from the concept through to something which is both robust and reproducible and reliable enough for somebody to base a business on uh, because those people who are working in the business all have mortgages and families and they want to have an income next year as well as this year. Um, so they have to be established and they've got a long way to go. In this space we've got a much smaller selection of things. These are, if you like, sciences. They're still sciences but I think there's grounds for believing they're close to technologies. It might be that we'll see some of these in mainstream systems around 2050, 2025. It should say 2025 there. Um, that's not to say that there aren't examples of these today, but they're point sources examples. They're not in, main, in mainstream technology areas. So we will have things at the moment which are demonstrating the potential and the concept, which is indeed, in, in my mind, is why they're demonstrated to be close to technology rather than a long way away from technology. So, conclusions then. We've got to focus on systems, not components, in 2025 timescale. Um, it's not the silicon technology, or the software, or the operating systems, or the interfaces, or the APIs. It's all of them. The products have to work, they have to function, they have to deliver the non-functional criteria as well as the functional criteria. At the moment, if we focus on components, then every time we integrate those components, there is a disconnect. There's an unreliability issue associated with it, and there's also a, an integration issue that comes along with it. It's fine to say that those components are going to come from various places, but to make a successful system, they have to work together. So the breakthrough will be designing as a system, not as components. It has to include silicon, software, optics, RF, audio, manufacturing, the, the whole lot. If it fails to be manufacturable, it doesn't matter how technology wonderf technologically wonderful it is, it's a failed product, it's gone. If it's late to market and somebody else gets there first, it's a failed product, it's gone. And all of the opportunities that it would have had to feed money back down the food chain of all of the, 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 the scientists and researchers and, and develop, development groups who've been involved in its creation up to that time, he's gone. Um, I'm pleased to see the Commission here this morning were actually saying the uh, economic development is the primary consideration. It is the primary consideration, but for an awful long time the Commission haven't been saying that. They've been saying something else entirely. They've been saying economic development is what we're trying to do. And then let's say, let's focus on technology. Well, it's not that. We've got to focus on economic development, which means we've got to understand how you get from technology, from science, to economic development, what the contribution is, how that contribution is made. At a simple level, the answer is bums on seats. It's people working in, the U in Europe and with nice high salaries, and the more the better. 
Uh, that's the thing which contributes to the economy. It doesn't matter, in essence, where the business is. That's just the tax man playing around. The, the real thing is people employed in the economy. So we've got to find ways of, let's say, the Commission should be looking at project proposals in the, in the sense of their economic return or their perceived economic return. Not everything is going to work out, but that will become a consideration, I'm sure of it. Expect it in the specs for the new proposals. The side effect of all this, though, is that professional applications have got to work with the crap commercial processes. That's the only option you've got. You can't afford the full com uh, economic cost of developing a new process, whether it's a, a silicon process or a new operating system or a new filing system for your professional application. The cost is just orders of magnitude, many orders of magnitude more expensive. So what you've got to do is you've got to find a way of working with that, the commercial thing, to deliver the things that professional applications still need. They're still there, it's just that the design problem is now not designing with transistors, the design problem is designing with the technologies that you've got. In many respects, that's always been the engineer's job. The engineer takes the technologies which are available and produces an optimised solution. An optimised solution, that's all for the professional markets as well. Thank you very much. I'll stop talking at that point. Anybody want any questions? They're quite free. What that is, is focus on systems, not components. What I'm saying is, is manufacturing is part of the uh, components which go into a product. Okay? So it's like software is a component that goes into a product. It's a virtual component. But manufacturing is a component that goes into a product too. So the process of manufacture, not manufacturing is, I'm not saying support a factory. What I'm saying is, when you design a product, you have to consider how it's going to be made. So I think it's probably a different thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think it's a level of setting expectations. Yeah. You know, if I, was, if I was in the fusion technology business today, then I'd be telling you as the Commission who are going to fund me that I'm just two or three years away from having a capability here. Yeah, but it's not realistic. It's not realistic, okay? okay. So that's why we need to set the expectations correctly on yeah. this. There, is, there are these stages to go through, and it might be that you can go through them fairly quickly, but you are going to have to go through these stages. And before it gets into a, into a product state, it's got to be established enough to do that. Now, it may be that you can go hop, 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 but it may be, and it may be that the only thing that you need in your product team is one capability. You know, if you're making aspirin, then you know, it's science becomes technology becomes aspirin. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult. But it, for most of the things that we're talking about, you need lots of capabilities. And they all have to come together. In some cases, you're adding several of them to enable you to make, let's say, a new HPC machine. You actually need to have several capabilities that you don't have today. They've got to be put in place. Uh, so I think understanding that you've got the stages mm -hmm. at least enables you to scale the amount of time that it's likely to take between them. Now, uh, the, the example I quote in another talk is the Antikythera, which is a machine for predicting the solving the equations of motions of the planets. The first prototype uh, was produced 1.8 thousand years before the technology caught up with it enough to make it into what was even then a limited production run. So the, this, this gap can be very large indeed. I don't think in most cases it's as large as that because even fusion technology has been going for, what, 20, 30, 40 years probably. Um, but, I mean, uh, laser hung around in this department for a long time. Uh, so I, I think that some things can look very easy, actually can turn out to be easy science but difficult technology. Well, sorry, I'll be honest, I don't think you can even say that in an absolute sense. There are some aspects of software which take very much longer. There are some aspects which are very quick. But they are different. And in the same sense, you can design hardware in, in that way. It may take a long time to produce a chip. It doesn't take a long time to produce a, a printed circuit board with three or four transistors on it. That may actually be all you need outside a standard chip to make your product into something which has got commercial, co commercially different value. Generalizations are always difficult. So some hardware, if it involves making a chip, is going to take a long time. 
But some software is going to take a long time. You're going to write software for a high reliability system associated with automotive. That's going to take a long time. You know, so, but yes, if you want to write an app for a, uh, for a platform like this, then you can turn out an app primarily because the customer doesn't give a damn whether it works because you're going to update it every, every few weeks for, it, for forever, which is an appalling um, I say technology model. I don't have to even make it work. I just ship it and keep shipping it until eventually it gets good enough to be, to be <coughs> worth something. Yeah. Okay, well, you've got to remember, first of all, that luck plays a big part in everything in business. And this is luck as well. Um, we were originally set up to make these chips for the Acorn computer, as you say. And the intent was that we were going to be making the processor that went in the Newton. And the Newton was going to be a big success. Yeah. Right. We were going to be making the chip in a fabulous model. So our business model in those days was to be a fabulous company. Now, Newton failed. Uh, there was two or three other companies that we were working with. We had also designed chips for those. They also failed. We were left with an, no alternative and actually wanted to use an ARM processor as a cell in our cell library. And ARM was left with the idea of using that in a worldwide commercial model. So the, tech, the, the breakthrough was the business model. Because the, the breakthrough was we're not going to sell it as an IP. We're going to um, give you a, a low-cost access to this IP, but we're going to help you to make it into a product. So the royalty model was the thing which, which appealed to people. That was the breakthrough. Now, the luck aspect of it. In many ways, we were lucky that the standard product chips that we were making for Newton and for the other two companies failed. Because if, we had, if they'd succeeded, we'd have been a... Uh, um, a standard uh, fabulous semiconductor company. Uh, the fact is that we're not. We've got into all of these companies, but although we're into all of these companies, relatively speaking, we're still a tiny company. We're only three, three and a half thousand people big worldwide. We have 28 offices. Uh, we, you know, we spread very thinly. Uh, we have a, um, an economic model which gives us pence for every one of these things that are shipped. The saving grace is they ship a lot of these things, 60 billion to date altogether. I um, mean, so that, that amounts to a respectable sum of money. Now, it's nice to be called a success, but we mustn't pat ourselves on the back too much on this thing because as a success, we are undoubtedly contributing to the European economy and around half of our staff are in Europe. But it's still tiny. You know, we're one and a half thousand people big in Europe. They're all paid well. So generally speaking, I think the, uh, the average salary in ARM is about twice the national average. So, you know, we're all paid quite comfortably, um, which is a nice place to be. Uh, our, our business model is dependent on so many other considerations in the market. We're not even vulnerable to particular market uh, variations. So it's, it's an excellent place to be. But will it scale? To, um, to support the population of 300 million in Europe? Ooh, not sure about that. I don't see any plans in ARM to produce you know, a, a 30,000 people company. It's going to grow, but it's not growing uh, meteoric. It's growing uh, uh, gently, and it will continue to do so. I think the, the opportunity, on the other hand, is based on recognizing the contribution. Because if you, if you only look at ARM, which most of the politicians tend to do, you only look at ARM in terms of the factory that we've got, then we haven't got one. So you can't have a photo shoot outside ARM's factory. You can't turn up and have your, your picture taken. You know, there's, there's, we've, got, we've got stuff, but the stuff is people sitting in front of computers. It's boring. You know, it's, it's not impressive to look at. Um, politicians don't really get it as a result of which they say, well, our contribution is, is not really very good. If you start to recognize that contribution is employed bums on seat uh, times salary, then you can start to look at all of the universities and the university departments, which are all doing good work. They also don't have factories. And yet they, sh they are also going to be relatively well paid and sometimes are surprisingly big. And I think that we've, we've got to change that economic model, which is part of the reason why I'm very, very excited about this. Because having a factory is a way of contributing to the local economy, I have no doubt. But you sum up all of the people who are working in... 
and I would say arm-like companies. These are people who've got specialist knowledge. They're delivering it to customers frequently all around the world. There's 10, 20, 30, 100 maybe of people in, in these companies. They don't count because they don't have a factory, but they should count because they are people and they are expensively paid. And I think that that is so important to get that economic model right. I'm sorry if it turned into a lecture. I mean, these, these are making use of the technologies which have effectively come out of commercial technology development. Uh, people, people who are designing IoT type things, and we have an IoT offering called Embed, M-B-E-D, um, that we realize that an awful lot of IoT people are not technologists at all. So they, they simply they have a, a, a fancy idea, whether it's to you know, automate watering gardens or collecting statistics about you know, road traffic use or anything like that. They have an idea, and they want to implement the idea, and they need to be isolated from the technology underneath as much as possible because they really don't understand it. They won't value it. So whatever business model is going to support this thing, from their point of view, they're effectively going to take components out of a rack, put them down together, connect them up, and it does the thing they want. That's, that's, the, bit, that's the design model that they want to work with. We will use that in the professional space, believe me. We will use it for more sophisticated use. We will use it in ways that it was never intended, but we will use it because it's, uh, because it's something which has, let's say, it's gained its value, it's gained its reliability, it's, it's there because of that commercial imperative. Uh, anyway, just to clarify, the objective of this workshop is uh, thinking about uh, computing for cyber physical systems, yep. which is a very closely oriented uh, subject in the, the line of what the Commission Relative is doing to support the, the utilization of the European industry. Now, there is no doubt that science uh, is, uh, let's say, new sky research is needed. But is, uh, in Europe, the European Commission is funded under another uh, part of the budget. So not, you know, uh, I, I, I better sit down. To enter this kind of discussion, because uh, I, mean, I would like very much to discuss about completely new type of architectures and uh, computer devices and so on. But certainly, those are not things which will go into the market in the next few years. So, just focus the.